Well, last night, Bob Saget's family revealed his cause of death. And let me tell you, a lot of people out there were shocked, including myself. Authorities say Bob died of blunt force head trauma after he accidentally hit the back of his head on something that nothing of it, thought nothing of it, and then went to sleep. No drugs or alcohol were involved. Bob, who was 65 years old, was on a comedy tour when this happened, and a lot of folks speculated that it may have been a heart attack or a stroke. That makes a lot more sense, Al. What did you think when you found out that it was due to head trauma? I, it, it was a weird thing because I immediately thought, well, this is going to shut down the conspiracy bots. It's like, oh, this is for money or some kind of weird thing. But also in a weird way, in almost a perverse way, it's almost worse because it just shows you how fragile life is. I almost wish that it was a CIA alien agent that came and did it because the idea that somebody that's larger than life can be taken from us from basically hitting their head is a really scary thing to me. So it's, I, I get it, it makes total sense, and it's still just as scary. And it, yeah. I, I, I wanna bring in Dr. Coley because I know a lot of our viewers, including everyone here on this panel, we don't want this to happen to us, to any of our loved ones, God forbid our children. Dr. Coley, thank you for joining us from, from San Jose. You're so close, right? Aren't you? Yeah, you are so close to my parents' house. Go say hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Dr. Coley, what did you think when you heard the news about Bob Saget? To be honest, guys, I was incredibly shocked because really I had speculated it would have been a heart attack or stroke being a man at the age of 65. So to me, it was just like Al said, very much a humbling reminder of how fragile our life is, how careful we need to be. And I think it brings up this important conversation of when is a bump on the head just a bump on the head versus something more ominous. Well, I mean, Doc, I got to ask you, like, how common is, is this sort of thing? This is one of the reasons it caught me off guard because it's not that common. I mean, a subdural hematoma, which is what Bob Saget had, which is essentially a bruise in the brain that gets bigger and bigger over time because you've torn one of the veins in the brain, is not that common, only 200,000 people. Now it is more common in older people because as we get older, our veins get a little bit more fragile. Our brain also shrinks, which gives those veins a chance to stretch a little bit more. Um, so I'm not surprised that it happened. You know, he's 65 years old. But the question that I wanna ask is, was he on a blood thinner or any other medications that could have perhaps increased his risk as well? Mm -hmm. Dr. Coley, how are we supposed to know when it's just a bump on the head? And I want to add to that conversation, too, because I was sharing with the group that I actually got a concussion when I fell down the stairs and I never actually hit my head. I just fell on my butt, um, but it, it jarred my, bra right. my head, obviously. So how do we know if it's something more serious than just, you know, a, a jerk or like a, a bump on the head? This is such an important question, Erica. We are all thinking this, right? How do we know when we hit our head that it's something more serious? And what you're bringing up is actually what's called an acceleration deceleration injury, where you just kind of jar your head like in a car accident, for example. Um, so let's talk about the signs and symptoms. It's really what happens during the accident and then right after that tells you whether or not it's serious or not. So during the accident, you want to think about how you hit your head, how severely you hit your head, and where you hit your head, because you're more likely to, to cause damage in the back or the top than the front as much and then whether you lost consciousness even if it was for a brief few seconds because a lot of times the onlooker will say oh they, they were out and they came back so it's not serious and that's not the case and after you want to make sure you look for signs and symptoms that something may be happening so a headache that's getting worse not better not at the site but kind of all over that's suggesting that there might be extra pressure in the brain nausea or vomiting you know lethargy feeling fatigued, feeling like you're drunk or not able to walk in a straight line, or if somebody else notices that you're not quite as alert as usual, you're forgetful, those are serious warning signs. All right, Doc, we talked about us and older people. What about kids? They fall and hit their heads all the time. I have two young boys. What do we know? How do we know it's not more serious than just a bump on the head when sometimes they can't even communicate? Yeah, it's a great point. So I would say first thing, loss of consciousness. So make sure to check whether or not they lo they lost consciousness at all. Second, you want to see their behavior afterwards. Are they playing or not normally? If they're crying, if they're not eating and they're not playing normally, or you find that they're just more tired, kind of seem out of it, not as arousable, those are warning signs that something may be going on. The nausea vomiting, they may not necessarily tell you about if they're feeling nauseated or whatever, but again, the eating patterns will really tell you a clue as to whether or not their behavior is normal. 
Oh, terrifying. I'm so glad that you gave us all that information, Dr. Coley. That is life-saving, and I just want to offer our collective thoughts and prayers to Bob Saget's widow and their children. I, I can't imagine how they must be feeling. Uh, I do want to ask you, though, about another celebrity speaking out about a health scare risk uh, right now. It's Better Call Saul actor Bob Odenkirk. There he is. So, Dr. Coley, he said that he collapsed on set, suffering a heart attack, and that two crew members performed CPR and used an automated defibrillator. It took them three attempts to restart his heart. What's your advice to people in this type of situation? The, the advice here, guys, is that you can save somebody's life if you know what to do in this type of situation. So this is a great example of somebody doing hands-only CPR very quickly, meaning perfusing blood to his brain and his organs as soon as he collapses, while somebody else runs and gets the defibrillator, which is, you know, applies electricity mm. to the heart to get it started. So it's so important for us to know how to do CPR. It's really important for us to know how to use a defibrillator, which is quite easy with just stick on the sticker and turn it on essentially it does its thing but this year for valentine's day i want to make sure that all the hosts of dbl learn hands only cpr which is yes. push hard push fast break the sternum that's how hard you're pushing and everybody has to rotate out every few seconds because if you're doing high quality cpr you're going to get tired after about five minutes so I'm we're going to hopefully shape. do that next week even you would get tired, Dr. Jackson. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Do not give him that title. You, man, it I took you it. like 18 years of medical school and residencies. Don't just throw around that title, Dr. Coley. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Dr. Coley. Love you, Doc. Thank you so much for answering these questions. And what a gift if we can all learn CPR by you.